Ulysses S. Grant's presidential term was eight years, which is twice as long as the American Civil War, yet the vast majority of writing on Grant is on his Civil War service. This is partly because of the monumentous significance of his role during the war, but also because of the era he presided over as president. Grant was president during the Reconstruction Era, which lasted from 1865 to 1877, and consisted of Grant's presidency and, before him, Andrew Johnson's. Naturally, any period following a major war is less likely to spark the same interest and excitement as the war itself. In addition to this, there isn't much that can be romanticized about the Reconstruction Era. Following Abraham Lincoln's assassination, Vice President Andrew Johnson took office. As a Southern Democrat, Johnson took the nation in a different direction than Lincoln had intended to. His goal was to reintegrate the Southern states as quickly as possible. In regards to the newly freed slaves, Johnson felt no obligation to ensure their civil liberties were protected. This isn't to say there were no advancements in civil rights during this era. Beyond the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment stated that no state could infringe on civil liberties provided by the Constitution, and the 15th Amendment gave voting rights to United States citizens regardless of race, color, or prior slave status. However, without proper enforcement, the new laws were effectively useless. Without employment or valuable skills, many freedmen returned to the plantations they'd worked as slaves, under work contracts which were essentially a form of neo-slavery. Violent groups of white Southerners such as the Ku Klux Klan prevented them from even exercising their new voting rights. It's likely things would have remained this way had Johnson had a second term. Grant hated Johnson's policies and immediately went to work changing the course of the nation. As president, he signed the 15th Amendment into law. As mentioned, white Southerners initially prevented blacks from exercising their new right, and in response, Grant used the military to prevent suppression of the black vote. By 1872, he'd effectively destroyed the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan would eventually reemerge, but only 43 years later. But much of the damage was already done. By the time Grant took office, seven of the former Confederate states were readmitted into the Union, as Johnson's terms for admission had been very lenient. From the day Grant entered the White House, he had limited options. But he was also facing the fact that many people were sick of anything to do with the war, not just the Southerners, but also Northerners. During and after the war, national emotions and ideals were high. Many in the North were passionate about preserving the Union and punishing the rebels. And while not as universal, many in the North were committed to freeing the slaves, if for no other reason, to give all of the death in the war some meaning. By the end of the Civil War, the Confederacy had been defeated, securing the future of the Union. And by 1873, the first year of Grant's second term, the nation was suffering a depression. This, on top of the growing war weariness, meant Northern sentiment was no longer so strongly invested in the past moral causes as people had their own financial hardships to deal with. Grant's reconstruction policies demanded that time and resources be used to defend the newly freed slaves. With the country struggling through economic difficulties, these policies became less and less popular. As such, Grant began to dampen Reconstruction efforts. At the end of his second term, he oversaw the Compromise of 1877, which effectively ended Reconstruction in the South. While Reconstruction wasn't a complete failure, it hardly met its idealistic aims. As the nation at large lost interest in greater causes, so did many of those in public offices. Corruption began to run rampant during Grant's administration as more and more people entering politics came from political machines and were motivated by money or job security more than loyalty to their people, nation, or states. Corruption especially ran deep in the Republican Party. It's widely believed that Grant wasn't involved in the corruption himself. He tried to fight it, 
but simply wasn't experienced enough in politics to be effective. Grant had, after all, come from the military, and in a deliberate attempt at not being partisan, he hired many of his friends and allies from the military rather than Republicans already in Washington. This ultimately meant that Grant didn't have the skills or people around him to play the political game. When he inevitably sought help from people in the political world, it came from the likes of Roscoe Conkling, someone who helped Grant fight corruption, but was just as corrupt himself. As even modern defenders of Grant will concede, he was a terrible judge of character. Despite his successes in the Civil War, he simply didn't have a mind for politics, and as such, spent much of his time trying to figure out who he could trust without actually getting much done. A perfect example of this comes from his plan to annex Santa Domingo. Grant wanted to use the nation as a navy base, but also as a refuge for freed slaves. He hoped that by giving them new land to immigrate to, he'd also give them leveraging power in dealing with their southern white employers. Grant firmly believed he had the support of Senator Charles Sumner, but Sumner turned on Grant and withdrew his support as he never liked Grant or took him seriously as a politician. Other failures include his plan for better treatment of Native Americans, which hardly even met its goals, and his failure to properly respond to the Panic of 1873, which led to a recession, which at the time was called the Great Depression. Even the successes of Grant's administration are generally overlooked, as is the case for the successes of many presidents of the time, such as Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, and Chester Arthur. For instance, each of them took steps towards civil service reform, to end the old spoils system ushered in by Andrew Jackson, which made political appointments based on party loyalty rather than merit. In fact, Grant addressed civil service reform more seriously than any president up to that point. However, it's simply not an issue that captures the imagination of people today. Grant's presidency is sometimes considered the first of the Gilded Age, an era in which robber barons, social reformers, and inventors all had a strong influence on the course of America and captured the nation's interest more than the president's. The overly negative attitudes towards Grant's presidency are sometimes attributed to the Lost Cause narrative, which painted many of the Union's heroes in a negative light. It's perhaps due to the Lost Cause that for a long time, Grant wasn't just considered a forgettable or mediocre president, but one of the worst. His legacy has had more positive reviews since the 1960s, especially for his efforts to defend the freedmen. However, he's still far from being considered one of the greats among presidents. At worst, he's written off as a corrupt president who infringed on states' rights and used the government for his own profit. At best, he's considered a champion of civil rights who boldly fought corruption all around him. And more moderate views present him as a president with honorable goals who saw some successes but was largely hampered by vast corruption which he was just not equipped to deal with. Even if Grant's presidency was definitively great, it's possible he would still be more remembered for his Civil War service. It's worth noting that even George Washington, who is often considered the greatest president in American history, is more renowned for his leadership in the Revolutionary War than anything he actually did as president. In some ways, the lack of a presidential legacy might speak to Grant's successes as a general. Perhaps, telling of Grant's own point of view is that his memoirs aren't focused on his life as a whole or his presidency, but rather his military service and end in 1865. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and donating on Patreon. Donations from $2 to $15 a month help towards more frequent uploads. Patreon link in the description below.